Hello and welcome to my channel and welcome to a Sunday morning meetup in which I discuss 10 British novels from the decade of the 1900s. This is the first part of a 10 part series in which I discuss 10 British novels from the 10 decades of the 20th century. In this first part I have picked one novel from each year of the decade to represent the variety of novels published in the 1900s. So book number one, Love and Mr. Lewisham by H.G. Wells was published in the year 1900. Love and Mr. Lewisham, subtitle The Story of a Very Young Couple, is set in the 1880s. It was among Wells's first fictional writings outside the science fiction genre. Wells took considerable pains over the manuscript and said that the writing was an altogether more serious undertaking than I have ever done before. He later included it in a 1933 anthology, Stories of Men and Women in Love, which is the anthology that I own. Events in the novel closely resemble events in Wells's own life. According to Geoffrey H. Wells, referring to the question of autobiography in fiction, H.G. Wells has somewhere made a remark to the effect that it is not so much what one has done that counts as where one has been, and the truth of that statement is particularly evident in this novel. Both Mr. Lewisham and Mr. Wells were, at the age of 18, assistant masters at country schools, and that three years later both were commencing their third year at the Normal School of Science, South Kensington as teachers in training under Thomas Henry Huxley. The account of the school, of the students there and of their social life and interests may be taken as true descriptions of those things during the period 1883 to 1886. Book number two, Kim, by Nobel Prize winning author Rudyard Kipling, was published in 1901. The story unfolds against the backdrop of the great game, the political conflict between Russia and Britain in Central Asia. The novel made the term the great game popular and introduced the theme of great power rivalry and intrigue. It is set after the Second Afghan War, which ended in 1881, but before the third, probably in the period 1893 to 1898. The novel is notable for its detailed portrait of the people, culture and varied religions of India. The book presents a vivid picture of India, its teeming populations, religions and superstitions, and the life of the bazaars and the road. Book number three, Anna of the Five Towns by Arnold the Bennett, was published in 1902. The plot centres on Anna Tellwright, daughter of a wealthy but miserly and dictatorial father, living in the Potteries area of Staffordshire, England. Her activities are strictly controlled by the Methodist Church. The novel tells of Anna's struggle for freedom and independence against her father's restraints. Stoke-on-Trent has become known as the Five Towns because of the name given to it by the local novelist Arnold B Bennett. In his novels, Bennett used mostly recognisable aliases for five of the six towns. However, Bennett said that he believed five towns was more euphonious than six towns, so he omitted Fenton, sometimes referred to as the Forgotten Town. Book number four, The Way of All Flesh by Samuel Butler, was published in 1903. The Way of All Flesh, sometimes called Ernest Pontifex or The Way of All Flesh, is a semi-autobiographical novel by Samuel B Butler which uh, attacks Victorian era hypocrisy. Written between 1873 and 1884, it traces four generations of the Pontifex family. Butler dared not publish it during his lifetime, but when it was uh, published in 1903, it was accepted as part of the general reaction against Victorianism. 
Book number five, Hadrian the Seventh by Frederick Rolf, was published in 1904. Frederick Rolf wrote under the pseudonym Baron Corvo. Rolf's best-known work, this novel of extreme wish fulfillment, developed out of an article he wrote on the papal conclave to elect the successor to Pope Leo XIII. The prologue introduces us to George Arthur Rose, a transparent double for Rolf himself. A failed candidate for the priesthood denied his vocation by the machinations and bungling of the Roman Catholic ecclesiastical machinery and now living alone with his yellow cat. Rose is visited by two prominent churchmen, one a cardinal archbishop. The two proposed to right the wrongs done to him, ordain him a priest and take him to Rome where the conclave to elect the new pope has reached a deadlock. When he arrives in Rome he finds that the cardinals have been inspired, divinely or otherwise, to offer him the papacy. He accepts and since the only previous English pope was Adrian or Hadrian IV, he takes the name Hadrian VII. I should have said Hadrian VI. The novel develops with this unconventional chain-smoking Englishman peremptorily reforming the church and the early 20th century world against inevitable opposition from the established Roman Catholic hierarchy, rewarding his friends and trouncing his enemies. Generally, he gets his way by charm or doggedness and, of course, by being much cleverer than all those around him. But his short reign is brought to an end when he is assassinated by a Pope-hating Scotsman, or possibly Osterman, and the world breathes a sigh of relief. This is a preposterous novel. Book number six, The Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Ortsy, was published in 1905. The Scarlet Pimpernel is the first novel in a series of historical fiction by Baroness Ortsy, published in 1905. It was written after her stage play of the same title enjoyed a long run in London, having opened in Nottingham in 1903. The novel is set during the Reign of Terror following the start of the French Revolution. The title is the nom de guerre of its hero and protagonist, a chivalrous Englishman who rescues aristocrats before they are sent to the guillotine. Sir Percy, Sir Percy Blakeney leads a double life, apparently nothing more than a wealthy fop, but in reality a formidable swordsman and a quick-thinking escape artist. The band of gentlemen who assist him are the only ones who know of his secret identity. He is known by his symbol, a simple flower, the skull of Pimpernel. Marguerite Blakeney, his French wife, does not share his secret. See, she is approached by the new French envoy to England, Chauvelin, with a threat to her brother's life if she does not aid in the search for the Pimpernel. She aids him and then discovers that the Pimpernel is also very dear to her. She sails to France to stop the envoy. Book number seven, Sir Nigel by Arthur Conan Doyle, was published in 1906. Sir Nigel is a historical novel set during the early phase of the Hundred Years' War, spanning the years 1350 to 1356. It is the background story to Doyle's earlier novel, The White Company, and describes the early life of that book's hero, Nigel Loring, a knight in the service of King Edward III in the first phase of the Hundred Years' War. The character is loosely based on the historical knight, Neil Loring. Book number eight, The Longest Journey by E. M. Forster, was published in 1907. The Longest Journey is a Bildungsroman by E. M. Forster, published in 1907. It is the second of Forster's six published novels, following Where Angels Fear to Tread, 1905, and preceding A Room with the View, 1908, and Howard's End, 1910. It has a reputation for being the least known of Forster's novels, but was also the author's personal favourite and one of his most autobiographical. It is the only one of Forster's novels not to have received a film or television adaptation. 
book number nine, The Old Wives' Tale by Arnold Bennett, was published in 1908. The Old Wives' Tale is a novel by Arnold um, B -B -B Bennett, first published in 1908. It deals with the lives of two very different sisters, Constance and Sophia Baines, following their stories from their youth, working in their mother's draper shop into old age. It covers a period of about 70 years, from roughly 1840 to 1905, and is set in Burslem and Paris. It is general, generally regarded as, as one of Bennett's finest works. Bennett was initially inspired to write the book by a chance encounter in a Parisian restaurant. In the introduction to, to the book, he says, an old woman came into the restaurant to dine. She was fat, shapeless, ugly and grotesque. She had a ridiculous voice and ridiculous gestures. It was easy to see that she lived alone and that in the long lapse of years she had developed the kind of peculiarity which induces guffaws among the thoughtless. And I reflected concerning the grotesque diner. This woman was once young, slim, perhaps beautiful, certainly free from these ridiculous mannerisms. Very probably she is unconscious of her singularities. Her case is a tragedy. One ought to be able to make a heart-rending novel out of the history of a woman such as she. Every stout, ageing woman is not grotesque, far from it, but there is an extreme pathos in the mere fact that every stout, ageing woman was once a young girl, with the unique charm of youth, in her form and movements and in her mind. And the fact that the change from the young girl to the stout Asian woman is made up of an infinite number of infinitesimal changes, each unperceived by her, only intensifies the pathos. Bennett also found inspiration in Mopusson's novel Unvi. Book number 10, Tono Bungay by H.G. Wells, was published in 1909. Tono Bungay is a realist semi-autobiographical -autobi novel written by H.G. Wells and published in 1909. It has been called arguably his most artistic book. Tono Bungay is narrated by George Ponderevo, who is persuaded to help develop the b b b b business of selling Tono Bungay, a patent medicine created by his amb oh dear, ambitious uncle Edward. George devotes seven years to organising the production and manufacture of a product which he believes to be a damn swindle. In part two of this series, I will discuss books by British authors published in the decade from 1910 to 1919. So that's all folks, but I'll be back soon with another booktube video.